I think I broke Unlike Uncle Bonsai, 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 we don't have to pay for this by the inch. <laughs> yes. <laughs> they have a live recording of them. Welcome back. We're ready for episode one, Telemachus. And we're getting into the book now. The first thing I want to say is that these uh, episode headings were not put there by Joyce. He never used uh, titles like Telemachus, which is our first episode. Uh, the book is generally referred to using those episode uh, titles just to make it easier to reference the Odyssey if you wish to go back and forth and publishers sometimes include them but that was never Joyce's intent but I'll use them so that if you want to look at the Odyssey you know which one we're in so which which episode so the the first episode starts out in the Martello Tower Neat, huh? like the way I got the picture in there. It's a real place, and Joyce actually lived there. And he lived there with a medical student. His name was Oliver St. John Gogarty. Uh, and this guy plays a rather key role in Joyce's life. So he's a, he's a real character, and I would suspect that the description of Buck Mulligan is probably pretty accurate and pretty much, pretty much like this. Gogarty character. Note the description of Mulligan, how he's he's wearing the robe and he's he's carrying the the bowl with the the mirror and the razor crossed and he's headed up the stairs. It it all brings to mind the the priest and the mass though there's an irreverence to it. Uh, sort of joking around but there's a dark side to this mulligan character he's not he's not a nice guy he's 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 kind of a jerk actually so just try to, to try to get in your mind and and as you read it pay attention as as it develops into a mock mass now before he heads up he calls uh, Stephen tells him to get up Kinch which is Irish for knife he tells him to get up and join him up on top of the tower. It's time to uh, shave and get started in the day. And Stephen's sleepy and he wakes up and he goes up the stairs and, and joins Mulligan. They have a house guest, Haynes. Uh, this guy's uh, English. He's staying with them. He's in Ireland to study the uh, quaint Irish folk language. Now, Remember, our central theme is usurpation. So we have a usurper right here on the home turf of Stephen. There's an Englishman there, and he's there to study the quaint Irish language. He is also a real character. And when uh, uh, Joyce lived in the Martello Tower with Mulligan, they did have this guy from England stay with them who was doing that very thing, studying Irish folk language and there is a reference uh, to a nightmare that Haynes had about a black panther and he wakes up yelling and screaming that actually happened too and in fact Haynes woke up he was yelling and screaming he grabbed a gun and he started firing in the dark and it scared the hell out of Joyce in fact it scared him so bad he moved out that day so there is discussion between Stephen and Mulligan about Haynes and the nightmare and he was raving in the night. That actually did happen. Real event.
Now, going forward, remember that Stephen is a smart guy and he is also a poet. So he thinks poetically and this can make Stephen's thoughts hard to follow. Now there are two things going on here. One is that Joyce really is the developer of this stream of consciousness. Joyce realized that we don't think in linear thoughts. And if you pick up most novels written in a prior age, read Dickens, for example, when characters think, they, th they think in complete sentences, paragraphs, it's totally structured. You know, what do I want to do today? I will start by having coffee and then I will take a shower and get dressed and go to work. But that's not how we think. We, we think in very fragmented starts and stops and jerks and we jump topics and, and different things inspire us. And Joyce realized that. So Stephen, being a poet, has this same kind of uh, jumping around thought process but because of the the poet in him, his choice of words is a little more complex than uh, somebody else. So he can be a little bit hard to follow, but don't let that throw you. Just go with it. Sometimes Joyce likes to just play with language and words, and it's fun to just watch his wordplay. And Stephen will think of things, and he'll just wordplay in his mind. And it's, it's fun to follow that. So don't let that throw you off. Now Stephen's mother has died recently and on her deathbed she asked Stephen to kneel and pray for her and he refused. He will not bend his knee to the Catholic Church and he can't separate himself from it. He, he remains Catholic. This is very much like Joyce as well where he refused to submit to the Catholic Church but he could not separate himself from it. So you notice that Mulligan mocks him and calls him the damn Jesuit and you know makes fun of him and yet Stephen is wearing black he's in mourning so he honors the tradition of mourning but he refused to kneel and pray and there's a there's an exchange with Mulligan where t t Mulligan tells him he's got some used clothes for him that he'd look great in and Stephen says well unless they're black I can't wear them and Mulligan says, well, look at this. The guy won't kneel and pray it for his dying mother's deathbed, but he won't wear gray. You know, it's only wear black. It's a bit of a paradox, and I think it is an interesting paradox because Stephen is a very complex guy, so you want to watch for those sort of complexities. They're very interesting to just explore. Stephen is certainly not a traditionalist, but... He is going to wear the black for, for mourning. And an interesting uh, parallel is that Bloom, who we'll meet later, is attending a funeral today. It's, uh, again, June 16, 1904. June, uh, Bloom has to attend a funeral, and so he is also dressed in black. So it's very obvious that these two guys have this connection in mourning. It is, I think, a pretty interesting way of doing things as well. Then we have a little exchange between Mulligan and Stephen about Stephen's hurt feelings. Now, we've just had this sort of mockery about, you know, he's refused to bend the knee and he's wearing black for mourning. And then Stephen says, you know, you, you hurt my feelings. And, and Mulligan says, what? You know, what are you talking about? And he says, well, you know, at your mother's house when she said, you know, who's here? And you said, oh, it's just Stephen. His beastly mother is dead. And Mulligan is a medical student. He's dealing with death and cadavers for... Uh, learning all the time so he doesn't think that much of it and he says it is it's all a beastly thing the whole death thing is a beastly thing it doesn't think nothing of it you know I didn't mean anything by it and Stephen says that uh, 
you know, while I'd, I was hurt by it. And he said, I, it's, it's nothing. It's, I didn't mean to offend your, your mother. And he says, no, it's not the offense to her. It's the offense to me. And Mulligan's sort of taken aback at that. And that gives you some insight into Stephen's emotional makeup and his, and his sensitivity and his thought process. And again, you know, this guy refused to pray at his dying mother's deathbed, and yet he has this other sensitivity. So he's, he's a very interesting, deep character. Then they move on to breakfast. And when they get to breakfast, there's there's a the old lady comes to sell milk and cream, and they ask her about the Irish language, and she doesn't know any of it. She says she can't remember any of the Irish language. So again, we get another thread of the usurpation that here's this English guy saying, "I'm here to study the English." folk language and it, and Engl and the uh, or Irish folk language and Irish custom and here's this elderly woman and surely she would know some Irish expressions and and sayings and she doesn't she doesn't remember the language it's been displaced by English so here you have the usurper in the house and the language has been usurped by English so watch for those uh, situations of usurpation. Though she doesn't remember the language, and she's just a simple milk lady, I think it's very interesting the way she does the math in her head. So I always get a, a chuckle out of that when I read it because it's kind of serious and almost heartbreaking that she can't remember the language but then when she does the math for the bill, she's click, 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 and that gives you a balance of this, and you got a, a leftover of this, carry the you know, she's got the math all worked out, which she's no dummy. And I think Joyce is trying to show that very fact that she is no dummy. She may not remember the language because the Irish language has been usurped, but she's certainly got the math skills. She's not stupid by any stretch. Now, as they leave, Stephen starts thinking about the key. And remember I said in the in the intro about the key being important. Keys can let you into things and keys can keep you from getting in. Keys can serve as the entry or the barrier. And Stephen begins to think about the key. Who has the key? He has the key in his pocket. He uses the key to lock the door when they leave. And then he begins to think, they'll want the key. They're going to want the key. They're going to try to get the key from me. And it's already on his mind that he's being usurped. He knows that he's being displaced. Even though Mulligan is his supposed friend, he mocks him, conducts this black mass, and insults him. Ask him for money, tells him they'll meet later, it's Coronation Day. Coronation Day is a reference to the, the king's head is on the money. And so that you know it's sort of slang for payday, Coronation Day. Get a four sovereigns. But Stephen is thinking about the key, and they're gonna want the key. Ultimately, he surrenders the key to Mulligan and he thinks that I might as well give it to him. I'm not coming back today anyway. And actually, in Joyce's life, with the incident in the Black Panther and Haynes shooting in the middle of the night, he left and never returned. So Stephen is thinking probably that very thing. He may be thinking he's not going to return ever, but he's certainly not returning that night, so he gives the key to Mulligan. And they agree they're going to meet up later for drinking. So as you go through the chapter, look for references obviously of usurpation, who's being overthrown. References to Ireland, the snot green sea, the poetic expressions that that come out of this and and references to Ireland, usurpation, of course. And there are many other uh, usurpers. Haynes, of course, is a usurper. 
Mulligan is a usurper. He asks um, Stephen for money. The old woman has lost her language. She can't remember it. It's been usurped by English. There's talk of drinking, which is a usurper of your self-control, which we'll see more of later, and we'll see many instances where people are, their lives are usurped by drinking. The, there is a talk of the keys, and we want to watch through the whole book as, as references to the keys come up. Again, keys can let you in, or they can keep you out, and Stephen surrenders his his key. And there are also references to Shakespeare. Now that's a little more subtle, but Shakespeare is also a usurper. Shakespeare is the great English writer, not the great Irish writer. So the great the great literary bard, and they refer to Stephen as the bard, the great the greatest literary bard, Shakespeare, English, another usurpation. So I would encourage you to look for more. There's all kinds of really cool references throughout the chapter. It's it's really a great chapter. It's a, good, a beautiful start to the book. So I hope this helps. I hope you enjoyed it. And put some comments down below. Subscribe. And I'll see you at the next one.